before I start reading this stack of paper, I just wanted to say a few things. Um, it was mentioned in the accessibility information, but there will be strobe lights in a lot of the video and GIFs that I showed, because basically every new show has a lot of strobe lights, so I kind of couldn't get around that, but nobody, as far as I've heard, has an access issue with them, but just so you know, I think that's happening. Um, I'm just curious, are there any just Nine Inch Nails fans here? <laughs> to a Nine Inch Nails show in San Francisco. They had not toured since 2013. I mostly live in Berlin, but I was going to be in LA. I managed to get these tickets. It was like, you know, the universe helped me out. But my one friend who is a fan could go, and so I needed to find someone who would be willing to not only like fly up there, book a hotel, like all of this, but also come to the show with me. So I have a friend who's particularly adventurous, Sagittarius Moon, and he was like, in an email, like, yeah, I'm totally down to do that, but I never was into Nine Inch Nails, I don't even know what their songs are, like, can you tell me why you like them? So I started to reply, and 2,000 words into this email, I was like, I think I need to move this to a word document. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's what happened, and I kept working on it, and it kind of kidnapped me and devoured me and ruined my life in some way because I was like turning down paying gigs because I was like, I can't do that. I'm working on a very important thing about nine inch nails, and like nobody cared, and my agent was like, you know, what about all these things that you have to write because you're under contract? And I was like, they'll all have to be put on hold. There's this project, and it's the most important. So she read it, and she was like, it's a bit long, you know, I don't know who is going to publish this, it's 7,000 words, and I was like, right, so I added 5,000 more words. <laughs> and it just proceeded to get rejected from everywhere. And it got rejected in a certain way. A lot of the time, people said, we like this, but we don't really know what it is. It's not enough memoir, it's too much memoir, it's not enough music criticism, it's too much, it's not theory, it's not whatever. And at some point I finally realized that what it was was a hagiography. So hagiography means the writing of the lives of the saints. This is a, a tradition that happened because the only people who were literate for many centuries were priests and monks. They were the only ones who knew how to read and write. So when mystics were having their kind of incomprehensible experiences, the job of the hagiographer was to just document this thing. And it was sort of necessarily incomprehensible, but they were going to try to write it down anyway. So that's where we're starting tonight. It's a complete gesture in enthusiasm and devotion I just love this band. I love Robin Fink. That's it. <laughs> um, so I wanted to say thank you to Linton Talbot and Hannah Nirali. Like, it, I'm really moved that you shared my enthusiasm and you found a way to support me in sharing it with all of you. And thank you to Draft and the White Review. And the White Review was like, going to publish this piece next year, and this was like the first time that they were like, no, we're going to take all 12,000 words, and I was like, oh my god. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. Very, very um, heartening and moving, and if I keep talking about it like that, I'll start crying. So, here we go. I'm going to begin now. They're really close to my body. Is it 
quote from Robin Fink, which we'll hear later. This is another very quote kind of sets up um, this talk, as well as you can see this poster on this side is some of Day's natal chart. And then there is this uh, lyric from the last Nine Inch Nails record, um, Bad Witch. I was 10 years old when The Downward Spiral by Nine Inch Nails was released in 1994, and I listened to it more than any other record for the next six years, when everything I knew about myself was disintegrating and becoming unknowable. It lives in my blood memory. It's the soundtrack to the most formative part of my life. When I think of that time, my memories resonate with those songs. I cannot imagine myself without them. Who I would have been. Since then, 25 years, I regularly go through periods where the only thing I listen to for months at a time is Nine Inch Nails. And this locates me, returns me to myself. When you love a band, for more than half your life, something happens with how their songs come to live in you. They echo through how you remember the past and fortify how you are legible to yourself in the present. Nin was also the first band that got me in trouble with grown-ups, and for this, they have a special place in my heart that no other band will ever touch. For Christmas vacation in 96, when I was 12, I brought the Broken EP with me when I went to stay with my Catholic grandparents. Broken was packaged in a cardboard digipack from the 90s, so my grandmother could just open it uh, instead of struggling with a plastic tool case. The lyrics were printed on the inside, but I was singing them all the time also. And I think my grandma had the biggest problem with my favorite lyric. Gotta listen to your big time, hard line, bad luck, this fuck. <laughs> but there was enough offensive sentiment on the entire record to gather my family for an intervention. They asked me how I could listen to this violent, raging, blasphemous music. My answer, because I like it, still seems to be the best response to such a question. The Closer video also got me in trouble. It was rarely played on MTV, and these were the days before YouTube. So I moved in a constant nervous hope that I'd be lucky enough to catch one of its late night airings and maybe even record it on VHS. One night I did get lucky, but I was at a sleepover birthday party with giggling girls in pajama shorts. We were 13, 14 years old. The TV was playing in the background. That electronic beat came on, animating via air through tubes, the raw pig heart nailed to the Turner chair. I squealed, turned up the volume, sat six inches from the screen, and I sang along and knew every word. I clapped when Trent Reznor, his aquiline profile and silhouette, licked that strange microphone that looked at once phallic and mammalary. <laughs> when the shots of him bound and blindfolded came on during the second chorus, I remember swooning and sighing as if I were watching a boy band. No one joined me. They all hung back. I can imagine the scene now, how they saw me, a person, lonely and young and singing to herself, leaning into that bizarre world on the screen, with its spinning eggs and crucified monkey and apple-mouthed pig and split-open nautilus. The world that summoned something powerful and fundamental in me and told me my dreams, although they had felt like it, were not deserted. Even if the world I've lived in so far, the world of this generic, bland, teenaged living room had been companionless for me, the world of that video promised something, that somewhere there were people who saw visions like mine, full of nihilism and perversions, but also a twisted beauty, a kind of gracefulness in all the shit. 
the birthday girl's parents called my parents and banned me from coming over again. I saved up to buy the VHS tour documentary for the self-destruct tour called Closure, which was released in 1997 when I was 13. It was the first VHS tape I ever owned. And what it contained and what it revealed about this band felt like I had discovered the Gnostic Gospels. The grainy image is murked and brown, shadow and light, and the music they play on a stage draped in shrouds and scrolls of loose cassette tape is brutal and desperate. The band destroyed their instruments, each other, and themselves. I love this one. <laughs> <laughs> Keyboards are stomped on until the keys look like ribs that have been cracked off spines. Multiple band members get injured. Trent throws a microphone stand that lands on the drummer's head, and with blood pouring into his eyes, the guy keeps playing. The crowd doesn't just wash, it tears itself apart, punching each other, crowd surfing, clawing their way toward the stage and they grab for Trent while bouncers fight them off. Trent sneers back, whoever threw that, fuck you.
most exciting live show imaginable. I would dream of that video sitting in class while the teacher droned on about the quadratic equation. I wonder what it feels like to be in that crowd, that room drenched in fury and sweat with those songs, that music, the most explosive noise I'd ever heard. Around this time, I started playing in bands, and I got to learn for myself how good it feels to turn your amps all the way up and scream until your throat breaks. It instilled a belief in me that I still have to this day, that any spiritual ailment can be cured by playing music at maximum volume in a small dark room. The behind the scenes shots and closure are even more infamous than the concert footage. They show the band destroying dressing rooms by heaving couches against walls, staggering around hungover, in clothes whose rank funk you can practically smell off the screen. I remember that there was a lot of ass and genitals on display, most of it male. Jim Rose's circus, a BDSM freak show, was one of the opening acts. And we watched one of the performers backstage try to lift an armchair hooked to his limp dick. Unfortunately, I don't have a gift with them. <laughs> Some of the most exhilarating scenes, not only in Closure, but in most of the videos from the tours of the 90s, show how Trench particularly enjoys attacking the lead guitarist, Robin Fink. Trent gropes him, leaps on him, twists him to the ground, shoves him off the stage into the crowd, and if it's not a tackle, it's an erotically menacing embrace. There is also a sequence on Closure's bonus materials where a nearly naked Marilyn Manson appears on stage and shoves Trent to the ground while kissing him. Along with the Closer video, these scenes constructed a world where sex converged with rage, which encapsulated the turgid passions of puberty in a way that no other band at the time did. Gruff, melancholic Pearl Jam could not get close to the feeling that being inside the belly of the beast is warm and wet, but it's also suffocating. In 1995, when I was 11, I remember reading a particularly lurid article in the magazine Details, which bloomed in my fantasies for years after. The interviewer asks Trent the five words he associates with sex. Trent replies, taste, sweat, lick, cum, bite. He's asked if he's into masochism and if he associates sex with pain. He says yes. As I would experience in the next few years, making out awkwardly in closets, bumping teeth and wincing at too long fingernails, not to mention being confronted with the banal brutality of young desire, sex and pain were not only linked, they felt like the same thing. The lyrics of Nine Inch Nails so simple and vulnerable in their angst, offered articulation into this rough new world. They were embarrassing as hell to sing along to, but that's exactly what made them meaningful. They explained the stuff that embarrassed you. Laying over the harsh, wrathful quality of the music, you could scream and thrash and flail about to the huge sounds, but still be talking about how small you felt. It was transcendent in a basic way that I've never experienced since. As an adult, I listen mostly to hardcore metal and noise, but I keep returning to Nim precisely because of those embarrassing lyrics. I mean, let's be real. You can't sing along to Merritt's Bell. Something elemental about what Nim did for me as a kid has remained central to who I am as an adult. My precious VHS of closure and the band it depicted represented everything I wanted and still want the, go the world to be. Chaotic, feverish, ungovernable. As an adult, watching closure cracks me up. How adolescent all those boys are, snickering at their dicks out and their rowdy tantrums. But I'd be lying if I didn't admit to some nostalgia. Adulthood has sobered me on the actual political impact of my rebelliousness. 
And I know that flipping off cop cars doesn't actually do anything to dismantle oppression, but it sure as fuck still feels good. It will always thrill me to shout fuck you to teachers, parents, bosses, to spit on the door of a bank, to crush a cigarette into the face on a politician's sign. When I see young goths and punks sitting in piles of each other outside drug stores, smoking their clove cigarettes and their Doc Martens, and writing lyrics on their fragile skin in ballpoint pen, I will always smile and nod and want to lean over and tell them, try to stay romantic about all that fury for as long as you can, because the romance of it is what will help the most. Nin is the purest expression of fury in music that I've experienced, and what I love most about it is how they femmed it and made it queer. It wasn't just that they wore lipstick while they broke themselves. Sometimes I send this photo to my friend just to, like, fuck up her day. <laughs> She's always like, it works! <laughs> It was the excruciating nakedness of the lyrics, paired with the visceral embodiment of their performance. But their performances proposed the body as something to hope to transcend, as well as revealing and articulating this hope as false. Such transcendence was not possible. The body was not something from which you could escape. You'll always have to drag it along behind you. Rather than this feeling like a punishment, however, a live Nin show is a testament to the fact that this embodiment could still feel enraptured and generative and mystical. This is because Nin is who most corroborated the fact that there can be a mysticism of fury. There are different kinds of mysticism, but all are primarily defined in terms of ecstasy, which comes from the Greek ekstasis, ek meaning out and stasis meaning stand. So ecstasy is the standing outside of oneself, an experience that requires a total transformation of both the self and where and through what it can stand. We usually understand ecstasy as being conjoined to joy, affording you an escape from yourself by catapulting you in sweet relief outside of your confining, earthly body of pain and frustration. But ecstasy can also be understood in terms of fury, rooted within and because of the bounds of your own skin. From this place, and only ever bound to it, implosive rather than explosive, fury transforms those bonds. Think of being throttled with rage, how your body shimmers with it. Think of the furies, the Roman goddesses of vengeance and justice who are ontologically defined by their transformations when an injustice occurs. They morph into human-shaped birds with blood shooting out of their eyes, and they torment the perpetrator, shrieking at him, until he is brought to justice. And then they transform again, this time into mourning old women, cloaked and heavy with despair at the fact that they've had to metamorphosize at all. Crucially, the implosiveness of fury, its roots and confines within the body itself, can be understood both as feminized and subordinate, because the oppressed, women, slaves, the disenfranchised, no matter the gender, have historically been equated with the body and reducible to and by it. Rage at such bondage is both limitation and liberation. Like the Furies, the thing that is transformed is not the external world, but the bodies of those who are most affected by the external world's perfidy and cruelty. Fury can never be asked for more than what it is at its most pure, and the same can be said of joy. Both are elemental but basic materials, the raw stuff of life. Although joy extends outward to stand outside of oneself, Fury expands what is interior. It tunnels into the deepest redoubt of your being, excavating a violent, primordial place made of need and want. A definition of fury could be 
that it is the mere unbearable reckoning with how you didn't get what you needed and wanted. This necessarily must take place at your tender, wounded core, which means that the transformation that fury offers, though it uncovers an infinite space within yourself, can stop at the edges of your own skin. Nin's fury, especially on stage, reaches this limit quickly. It produces a storm of ferocity, throwing the band members against themselves and the crowd and the music hurling forward in rapture and rupture. But if this storm was all their performance contained, the band would not be nearly as powerfully cathartic as they are. If they began and ended at fury only, the transformative mystical capacity that is delivered at a Nin show would stay grounded within the material perimeter of the body, circumscribing how lonely it is to live there. But it doesn't stop here, because Nine Inch Nails has, as its touring guitar player, an actual ecstatic mystic on their stage, Robin Fink. <laughs> Robin Fink. He is the biggest reason I am a Nin fan. But he is also something more. Someone I've followed for 25 years, who has shown me the way to places I never thought existed, let alone that I'd one day go to. It's not enough to say that he's my favorite guitar player, or one of the first rock stars who I wanted to be. What he's revealed to me has felt less like a veneration and closer to a kind of communion with another world. First, it was how he looked, which was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Not man, woman, or even human. And it revealed the way to a world beyond gender and the regime it imposes on the body, making his kind of ecstasy the kind that stands outside. As a dreamy queer kid on the brink of puberty, such a guide was life-changing and life-saving. But then it was so much more. It was how he played his instrument, which is signatory for its refusal to conform to the context in which he exists, and his performance while playing, whose fundamental characteristic is of someone entirely gone from this world. He is the strangest guitarist I can think of, not because his style of playing is the strangest, but because of the choices he makes for the kinds of stages he plays on. What he does, or Perhaps it's more accurate to say what he refuses to do produces a kind of radical negation of presence. Such a negation cantilevers away from the world of rock concerts, which are almost always about the creation and exaltation of a performer's presence. Robin is also the strangest celebrity I can think of. He's played on some of the biggest stages in the world with Nine Inch Nails, and for a decade, he replaced Slash in Guns N' Roses. But his career is a demonstration of the refusal of celebrity. He's given only half a dozen interviews in 25 years, and his first on-camera interview appeared last year. And when he does speak, he is extremely self-effacing. When he asked to introduce himself in a 10-minute feature on Nine Inch Nails, he said, I'm Robin Fink, one of the guitarists in Nine Inch Nails. He is the guitarist in Nine Inch Nails. I heard from a fan who, who waited for him outside the venue for hours after a concert that when he appeared, he introduced himself to her. Hi, I'm Robin, he said. Yes, she said. I know very well who you are. She's like, been waiting out there for four hours for him. So all of this took many years for me to understand what it, with what was happening, and it all synthesized recently. After watching him for more than two decades, I finally understood that he has been a role model for me, not in terms of how to be a musician, or a performer, or an artist, or even a person. Rather, Robin Fink showed me how to be a mystic. Despite its reliance on ecstasy, I can't explain what exactly mysticism is. No one can. That's the point. 
Mysticism is a state or an experience where language cannot go, and this ineffability is precisely what defines it. Another way of saying this is that if you can define it in words, it's not mysticism. The root of the words mysticism and mystery, mist, M-Y-S-T, comes from a Latin word for secret, right, worship, or a secret thing. And it originated in a Greek word that meant simply to close, as in closing one li one's lips in secrecy or shutting one's eyes so as not to see. The secret unknowableness of it is the only way to define it. So what this means is that mystics as such are always unknowable. The closest we can get to that <coughs> is to attempt some sort of interpretation that cannot rely on the tenets of interpretation. So an interpretation of mysticism will only ever fail. Amy Hollywood, a religious studies scholar at Harvard, uh, has written a book called Sensible Ecstasy. And she talks about how the actual body of the mystic, with its baffling behavior and teleological incomprehensibility, can be thought of as a text in a language that must be translated. So this, then, is the task of the hagiographer to interpret not only the life, but the very body of that which is beyond interpretation. If one cannot hope to know the unknowable, then hagiography is perhaps a coming to terms with this impossibility. Not to know, but to unknow. For me personally, the way mysticism feels in practice has to do with the paradox. It's where you can feel the edges of your body as, as they are being annihilated by and into something greater than you. In order to encounter anything, you first need a body to experience it. And so the paradox comes at this place of simultaneous existence and obliteration. To feel something being destroyed, you first have to feel its intactedness. How else will you feel your edges burning away? Don't they have to remain somehow as edges? It's so illegible a feeling, and yet it still happens inside your skin, or very, very close to it. It opens up an alien world, and yet that world seems to be located in your body somehow. It troubles the understanding of ecstasy as something that forces you outside of yourself. In a way, it asks if the transformation that mysticism produces is happening to you, or the world, or both, or something else that neither of those two are yet. Music, perhaps more than any other art, produces this simultaneous feeling of something happening very close to you, alongside or within, and feeling something much bigger than yourself, which you can't see or touch as it overwhelms and engulfs you. At least this is where I've experienced mysticism, when playing my own music and in the audience of others. There are plenty of musicians I like who seem like mystics in more obvious ways than Robin Fink, but it's precisely because he doesn't seem like one, the paradox, which pronounces it for me. So like most frontmen and lead guitarists, Trent Reznor is a god, but Robin Fink is a demon. Reznor is plenty diabolical, but Fink has a serpentine energy, Medusa hair, and it feels plausible that at some point in his life, he made a deal with the devil for the superhuman ability to excel at a wordless subterranean language. On stage, he moves as if no one's watching him, which I can't say about any other lead guitarist of his stature, and it reveals something important about how he positions himself on these rock star stages and how he refuses to perform the moves attendant to them. Here's one of my favorite videos. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just saying I'm 
despite this rejection of the spotlight, or maybe because of it, he is one of the most captivating performers I've ever seen. And this is really saying something, because he's doing it while he's sharing the stage with Trent Reznor. The friend that I took to the San Francisco show, who didn't know anything about the band, grabbed me at some point halfway through the concert to shout, I cannot stop watching the guitar player. At that moment, Robin's head and shoulders were bent over as if in a pillory, and he was trembling, almost motionless, like a Bouteau performer. When he performs, I mainly feel as if I should not be watching him, that I'm invading his privacy, or bearing witness to a deeply intimate act that just happens to be taking place on a stage in front of 20,000 people. He most resembles one of those inflatable dancing tube bodies in front of the heart of ships, whose limbs unfurl and elongate, keeping time. He convulses hypnotically as if in a trance. He often falls. He is very awkward. When he steps in time, like this video before, he lifts his knees really high, like a marionette puppet. <laughs> like, I don't know why, but this, by the way, this is affectionately known as the Robin Dance, uh, among the three fans of his that exist. He'll hook his own neck around his microphone stand a lot of time and rock back and forth with it. He grinds against his aunt, but it's never sexual. It's as if it's a door he wants to go through. And at the end of playing the bar, he often curls over completely. His guitar will touch the ground, like he's exhaling his whole being. He also does quite a lot of crouching at the side of the stage, hidden behind the speakers. When not in a swoony reverie, his expression is set to a grimacing frown. And sometimes, some more to the frown. Um, sometimes he'll stop playing his instrument altogether and just stand still. when he explodes with violence, but he never harms anyone else like Trent does, and so this makes it seem less like violence and more like a part of himself is breaking. There are so many fan videos online of Robin smashing, breaking, or throwing his guitar, knocking over microphone stands, and leaving the stage in the middle of the song if something doesn't sound right. But perhaps because his entire affect is of someone not entirely in this world. I love in this gift of like Trent's just like playing calmly. <laughs> and keeps playing calmly. You get the sense that when he exits the stage when he exits the stage, he is exiting this plane of reality or something, going to a place no one can follow. In many songs, when it's not his turn to play, he'll disappear from his spot at stage left completely and reappear when it is, somehow from stage right. I don't know where he goes. A uh, later video, I'll point this out, you'll see him like running behind, like, I don't know why or where he's coming from. So I first saw him when I was 10, in 1994, in the March of the Pigs video. I want to show the full video here. This is the same song from the video, the live video before. Just imagine though, I'm 10. I somehow managed to download this video over dial-up. <laughs> and I would watch and re-watch the 200 pixels wide file because it felt like it contained clues for how to live.
Tumblr gifts of, from that video are used when people are being extra. <laughs> <laughs> so, this first encounter with Robin Fink, though, changed my world. It was how he looked, how he moved, and what all of that seemed to mean, or maybe it was the meaning that it resisted. He was different than anything I'd ever seen, but also somehow radically different from the video itself. And this tension dilated the world of what men promised. He wasn't a man, and he wasn't a woman, and he wasn't really human. And standing next to the other guitarist, Danny Lohner, who had the goatee and unmistakable aggression of a straight white boy, Robin looked alien, femme, a future gender. His face is childlike and open, Caravaggio beautiful, pouty lips, shaved eyebrows, big moony eyes. You can do that, I remember thinking, which was another way of saying, you can be that. Although the camera fixates on Trent, it is Robin who is a personification of the song itself which goes from its thrashing 7-8 time signature and hammering screams to the major key piano breakdown where the melody lilts and the vocals entreat and doesn't it make you feel better. Robin stands behind Trent and the camera only catches him in the frame sometimes. He curves his neck and tosses his hair and he plays his guitar as if he's in a different room or even world than the rest of the band. This air of displacement, of existing somewhere else, well, you are also right here, reached into me as an explanation for the strange dislocation I felt in my body and its place in the world so far. I had never felt comfortable in my own skin, but not because of the skin itself, but because of what the world said my skin signified. When I looked at myself, I saw one thing, but when the world looked back, it insisted that it saw another. The confusion Robin instigated felt somehow familiar, and at some point it made me wonder if I was looking at something queer. Queer was a term I had heard about, but not known exactly what it meant. It was thrown around by kids my age as well as adults, along with gay, as an insult about a deviant form of desire, and also a marker of something profoundly strange. When I saw this person, and I looked like that. <laughs> when I was 10 and I saw this, it was like, oh my god. So when I saw this, it was as if he was embodied, he was embodying multiple worlds, and some of them were recognizable, but some were no, from nowhere I'd known before. And I understood then that the word queer means things that are not articulable. They cannot be contained according to conventional laws of meaning. And crucially, this made me realize not only that queer could describe me too, but that I wanted it to. On the surface, Robin was a signatory figure of the 1990s era of rock star gender fuckery, especially the goth section of it when Kurt Cobain was wearing dresses, and Marilyn Manson looked like a woman, and PJ Harvey's voice sounded like a man's. It was fabulous. At the time, though, being 10 years old, my identification with his look as something queer had less to do with like sexuality, per se, and more to do with the way a body looked and moved and how it did those things by either conforming to or breaking the rules. Because you know when you're a kid, it's all about rules following them, breaking them. So encountering Robin Fink was an encounter with someone whose embodiment was capacious enough to contain many seemingly disparate parts, demonic, angelic, etc. And it appeared that he lived in his skin comfortably, unconcerned with which rules he was breaking. 
And even as a child, before I started to think about mysticism and what exactly it is, something about encountering Rebel Fink had more in it that pointed me toward a standing outside of myself, which was an order of magnitude way bigger than the usual celebrity worship. The feeling of my own body compelled me toward thinking about mysticism, because for the mystic, the body has to be simultaneously felt and exploded. So the feeling that dominated me then, and still does, is that I wanted to live outside of my body, without and beyond it. But I also wanted it to shape shift and transform. I didn't know how to do this, or if it was even possible. But watching Robin Fink continuously slipping in and out of the roles that the world tried to put him in, showed me a way. Born in 1971 in New Jersey and raised in Georgia, most of Robin Fink's biography is unknown. When he does do press events with Nin, it is rare when he speaks at all. He is especially committed to maintaining his anonymity. In my research for this writing, I encountered more stories of him intentionally removing his name from projects than the projects themselves. When I interviewed Kelly Kalman, who runs the Facebook fan page, Think Yourself, which currently has 232 likes. <laughs> she told me... <laughs> it may have like 240 now. I haven't checked it in the last like four months. <laughs> she told me that she started the, the page specifically so that she could keep track of him, but it's been slow going. <laughs> The only public performance, the only public performance that he did in 2019 was at a charity ball for an animal shelter in Sonoma County. He was playing in a band that was one of 20 performers throughout the day. Following his hashtags on the internet, Kelly Kalman learned when tickets went on sale and she bought two and traveled across the country for the concert. She said she had no idea it was as intimate as it was until the event organizers emailed her to ask what she'd like for dinner. <laughs> it was set up in a tent outside of a farm, and she said the stage was about as large as a king-sized mattress. Sitting at her table, she was literally bumped into by Robin Fink as he was walking past her. She told me how he recognized her because she's the fan who waits for him outside of venues. And his eyes darkened. He gently led her and her friend outside and said he was happy to take photos and sign autographs out there, but once inside they had to promise him that they wouldn't take photos or draw attention to him in any way. I'm here to support my family, he explained, because the performance was directed by his wife, who is a trapeze artist. <laughs> Kelly told me that her stomach dropped and she worried that she'd overstepped some boundary despite it being a public performance that she had bought tickets for. In general, she said she worries about being creepy <laughs> because following him demands a certain persistence. <laughs> there is hardly any trace of him in the world. For a short time, he maintained a web presence in like 2010, 20, 2009, by answering fan questions on a web, on his website's message board in terse, enigmatic sentences. When he has had accounts on social media, they have been similarly, similarly short and baffling. As in 2010, when he tweeted 126 times to say things like this. <laughs> this is like seven likes and two retweets. <laughs> In 2018, when he gave his first ever video interviews, one of them with the rig rundown, one of them was a rig rundown with Premier Guitar. 
His long silences and awkward rhythm with the interviewer compelled YouTube commenters to say, <laughs> we don't have time to watch it all, but I would highly recommend it. It's like 45 minutes, and he's just standing there, really. <laughs> In clogs. Okay, so. The Closure documentary, then from 1997, has the most potent screen time he's ever had. And in it, we get only a glimpse, but in that glimpse, his archetype is established. This look, more than anything else, comprises the Patronus of my gender identity as a teenager. Also, before Nine Inch Nails, he had a brief stint in a band called impotent sea snakes, which performed in drag, and his persona with them was Queenie. He's 23 and 24 in this documentary. He's quiet and aloof. He's not one of the ones throwing couches. He has shaved eyebrows and paints white kabuki-style slashes in their place, and we watch him carefully draw lines on his nostrils with black eyeliner, for reasons we shall never know. <laughs> he opens his makeup box and compact and says proudly to the camera, see how fast I can do that? <laughs> he has a reedy, gentle, almost girlish voice, and this clashes with the shredded sounding screams that come out of him on stage. In almost every backstage shot of him, he's doing his makeup in the background, or briefly pushing his face into the camera. If I were that pretty, I would do that too. His ass is one of the ones on display, and this gif had to go in here twice. <laughs> when he does speak, he is peculiar and cryptic and strikingly articulate, but he rarely speaks. Another fan-made compilation I like is called Robin Fink Talking, and it's only two and a half minutes long. <laughs> An article in a guitar magazine once strutted the title, CONFIRMED Robin Fink has a speaking voice. <laughs> and of course, there is that hair. That Robin Fink hair. The first suggestion that Google offers when you type in Robin Fink is hair. In the 1990s, a kind of half ponytail sprouts from the crown of his head. It looks like a rotting palm tree. It could be said to be a precursor to Ariana Grande's signature half ponytail in the way that the dire wolf is the prehistoric mother of the chihuahua. <laughs> Over the years, Robin's mullet dreads have been topped with various arrangements like these. <laughs> On the tour of the uh, late 90s, he has a mohawk with little sideburns, and his makeup is very Kember Fowler, voluptuous horror, Karen Black. When Robin toured with Guns N' Roses, his hair was remarkable also. First, in 2002, he wore a Tom shirt. Shout out, John. <laughs> the front half of the crown is shaved, and the hair is long and loose in the back, as if he dipped his bald head into half of a wig. And then in 2006, <laughs> see this, this In 2006, he grows out his maiden beard and beard, to look like a homeless beach bum, complete with garbage bag and inexplicable knee socks. I have a later video of a Guns N' Roses show. Knee socks in Guns N' Roses. Any witch will tell you that hair is everything. The container of your power. If your hair is right, your confidence, your command, your sense of yourself are secured and definite and indestructible. Your hair is who you are. And as any queer kid will tell you, if it's not yet, you can get it cut to be that way. Getting your hair cut is a sacred ceremony. 
and when it goes wrong, the results are disastrous. I once wound up in the hospital with suicidal depression after a particularly atrocious haircut, and I am only half joking. Rock stars live and die by their hair. There has never been a sustained review of Robin as a musician, but in nearly every article where he is mentioned, this one included, the writer will remark on his hair. Robin's hair seems to signify everything notable about him his strangeness and inexplicability, but also something only he can pull off. Offstage, Robin has a penchant for wearing feather jewelry, chokers, shawls, and clogs. And this also makes Nine Inch Nails that much more voluminous for his inclusion in a band of guys dressed in black jeans and t-shirts. In every candid or behind-the-scenes photo I've ever found of him, he's wearing clogs with notable socks, <laughs> including white clogs. My friends are quite tired by now of me sending photos of Robin in his clogs. And I've heard Trent Hesner give him shit for it in videos of soundcheck where Trent is lamenting Robin's out here, he's got clogs, he's got red socks. These guys, <laughs> this is the other video, like interview that he finally did after 25 years. So these fashion choices may seem superficial to dote on, but they synthesize for me why Robin's presence is so amplifying to Nine Inch Nails and so noteworthy in the world of rock stars. It's not just his queer, in all senses of the word, comportment, but how indecipherable he is. The most common word I've seen used to describe him is weirdo, and that's by fans. His only mention in the fan-made Nine Inch Nails drinking game which is to be played during concerts or while watching live footage, is to drink when Robin does something weird. This inexplicability of how he managed to have a place in the world of mainstream rock and the way he occupies that place is why I care about him so much. I don't pay any attention to mainstream rock. Almost all of it is not for me. And I sometimes hesitate to call Robin Fink my favorite guitarist over K.G. Hino. Because K.G. Hino's music is the kind I listen to on a daily basis and go see live and try to make in my own work. And Robin's is not. But despite the fact that Hino-san is an unearthly shamanistic creature who conjures new universes of the strangest sounds, I actually find Robin the more perplexing of the two. When I say that K.G. Hino is a mystic, it's obvious. Of course he is. Based on how his music sounds, he looks exactly like you imagine he should. Robin, on the other hand, slips out of reach, but also into it. Calling him a mystic is not at all explicit, and it's taken me years to realize that this is what he is that this is also the role that he played in my life, watching someone slip in and out of legibility. I realized I was not necessarily watching an individual, but what was coming through that individual. Sometimes he's made of flesh and bone, with him grass, and sometimes he's on another planet. This incongruity, I have to say, is more intense in Guns N' Roses than Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> <laughs> so, where Guns N' Roses glories in its hyper-masculine instrument stroking, Robin seems to glory in nursing an oddly beating heart to oral life. In every video I've seen of Robin on stage next to Axl Rose, I think, who led this poetic, sonic, seamstress freak onto the same stage as a bunch of goons? <laughs> Are there any guitar players here? Did I ask somebody? No? No guitarists? Well, the thing about playing guitar is that it is a body in and of itself. 
and so you have to meet and understand it with yours. As with any lover, it requires that you invent and share language together, which only the two of you speak. To play it, you have to hold it close, carry it on your shoulder, use your whole body, both hands. You feel it vibrate through your bones, the skin of it rubs against yours, it has its own smell that mixes with your sweat, and you have to wipe it off when you're done. Robin has said that he plays an instrument you can carry, and this is key to understanding his role in a band like Nine Inch Nails, whose catalog is constructed basically entirely of synthesizer-based sounds. In one of the two interviews from 2018, he explains why he chose that guitar. And I'm going to play it now, and we'll get to hear him talking. Yeah, I just like the... Uh... I think I like about the guitar is this, is this thing here. Right? But there's not a lot of instruments that we have a push and pull with such a, a nuanced articulation, you know, both kind of hands hitting the same string but at all these different distances but at the same time. I think there's something to that that I'm quite fond of. And it is interesting because it's all right here. It's the strings and it's chords and, and really close to my body. <laughs> so the reason why guitarists in myth seem more likely than singers to have made deals with the devil is because the devil and the power he possesses, what he's selling, cannot be contained in an ordinary human body part like the throat. And it cannot be something as democratic as words. These common things used by all of us to communicate boring shit like what you need to buy from the store. And yet for all its transcendent power, sound is material. It needs matter to exist. It needs ears and a brain and a heart to hear it. Flesh to resonate through. A body to hold. In the case of the guitar though, this flesh has been possessed by something else. If you play the guitar, you consented to let this magical, unworldly force burrow into your soul, claim it, coil up in your gut, that place that quivers. It lives there now. Robin says, It's a superpower. It's an invisible cape. It's a magic trick. It's a tenuous operation of unfathomable nuance. It's an ever-evolving stream of happy accidents. It's a culture made up of weirdos and rule breakers and geniuses of design and beach freaks and brainiacs and cavemen and crooked little flowers. And it's been a huge part of my identity for as long as I can remember. This is why it's so disquieting to watch a guitarist destroy his guitar. It's like watching someone break his own arm. When I talk about Robin to other guitarists, I get my entire point across by saying, this is the motherfucker who upstrokes his way through the song, Wish. So that song, thrashing, belligerent, with my favorite fist fuck lyric, has one of the most hostile riffs there is, and it's the last place you think an upstroke would work. But Robin bobs his hand through it with the pluck of a polka. So you know what I'm saying with an upstroke, he's doing it here where you go up instead of down with your right hand. So we'll watch him do this. He's going to run across the screen and then he'll be on this side. <laughs> here we go. that Trent Reznor is playing that same riff and he's doing everything with a downstroke and Robin is playing the whole thing up which is really weird if you play the guitar Josh Homme of Queens of the Stone Age has said, 
said, you cannot upstroke your way to toughness. Upstrokes, <laughs> upstrokes are not common in rock for this reason. And also because downstrokes feel so good to play. They're like stepping down hard on the gas pedal or punctuating a sentence with an exclamation point. Punk, for example, is an entire genre played in downstrokes. Funk, on the other hand, flourishes with upstrokes because they fit very well into the pocket of the downbeat. If you've never played guitar, I don't know how well I can communicate the feeling of playing down. It's orgiastic, it stomps, it punches, it's gratifying, as gratifying, I would imagine, as breaking the windshield of a cop car with a baseball bat. I love to imagine that. But where downstrokes are a declaration, upstrokes are an inquiry. And this makes them more interesting because they complicate rather than simplify what you're playing. They're like a question mark, opening the sentence upward. They ask what goes up, and then they wait for the answer, and they need the next stroke to bring it. Must come down. Robin is a master of the upstroke in a field of players who tend toward the down. And this disregard for what is considered acceptably tough in rock music is a hallmark of his playing. He often starts the riff up, making the whole thing feel catapulted upward by its own velocity, as though he stepped on a landmine. Here's a good example of this. downstrokes, Robin will go up. He often wields his whole right arm like a violin bow, tapping the strings and letting them reverberate. So here is a good example of that. It's not just upstrokes that make his playing what it is, though. It's the entire universe he conjures with his right hand. The left hand is often the star for guitarists, how their value is measured. But a guitarist is only as good as his right hand, because that is where the notes being played by the left find their voice. You're playing an E chord with your left. But is your right hand chugga chugga ing because you're in a speed metal band, or is it oompa oompa ing because you're in a bluegrass band? Are you screaming the phrase, I want to die, or are you weeping? Are you saying, I love you, as a plea, or as a threat? I can't think of another rock guitarist who plays on stages as big as Robin does, who smuggles in such weird shit with his right hand. It's like he's carrying a little bomb of subversive sound and letting it explode within the verse chorus structure of a pop song. In his few interviews, he has cited textural guitar players as influences. He's put it, he likes lots of right hand funny business. And he said that he always likes guitar players that play in phrases like a horn player who needs to take a breath. When I interviewed Kelly Kalman, who runs the Facebook fan page, I asked her how she explains her devotion to Robin. She said that when people ask, she accounts for herself by playing a short video she took of them on the 2018 tour, playing the song The Background World. So this video is remarkable that she chooses this one to play because practically nothing happens. <laughs>
like garage rocky to me and more corroded, like the signal is being pumped through an old computer, spitting out digital decay. This 10 second clip is from that uh, one of the interviews he gave last year. his own composition and I have to say that after I saw it I spent several hundreds of dollars and many nerd hours customizing my telly to sound like that. I've never heard a Telecaster sound like that. Uh, it has long been said by musicians that you can tell a good one by what he does not play by the notes he chooses to leave out. So it reveals his understanding of the song as a structure and how his decisions not only hold it up but give it space to breathe and let it live its own life without him. It also shows how self-confident he is as a player, knowing that he doesn't have to blow his load over everything to leave a mark. Of all of the rock guitar gods, Robin is the only one I can think of who lets one or two notes do for him what the rest of the guys use dozens for. Here we're going to watch a short video of a Guns N' Roses show with the guitarist Richard Fortas and Robin playing uh, an instrumental cover of Christina Aguilera's Beautiful. <laughs> it's a good classic rock guitar double wank also. <laughs> And I've cut the beginning, but Fortis will start, he's the one in black. He starts with a cascade of noodling, and he's a fine player. I have nothing against him. But when Robin starts playing, you'll start to see what is soul and what is not. It has to do with Robin's timing, his cho choices about what not and when to play. And remember that he thinks of breaths between phrases, like a horn player. So he doesn't fill all the space with noodly notes, showing off how quickly he can go through scales. He'll let one note sing, just really sing. And there will be as many soundless pauses as there are notes. At around two minutes, he'll start to play rhythm, so Richard Fortas can have his turn to solo. Listen to the difference.
Um, so yeah, you can see there that when Richard Fortas starts playing, he, sorry, he, um, his spacing becomes rapid and crowded, which is totally like rock guitar expertise, but it draws the focus to him as a player and pulls the focus away from the song. It's like Ford has had something to prove about himself that didn't include the song. But Robin was content to let the song be bigger than he is because the song is. So because he seems to be driven to let himself be annihilated so as to make space for something bigger, I think of the medieval women mystics like Marguerite Porret, Julian of Norwich, Hildegard von Bingen. Many, actually, of the medieval women mystics spoke of letting themselves become nothing so as to let God in. There's the uh, Anna Carson essay, The Creation, where she quotes Simone Weil with this quote. What happens during mysticism, as Anne Carson talks about with Simone Bay, uh, is a kind of a decreation rather than a destruction. And it has to do with love, the most daring kind of it. For when an ecstatic is asked the question, what is, it, what is it that love dares the self to do? She will answer, love dares the self to leave itself behind. This yielding is what I see when I watch Robin perform. It's not just that he yields the center of the stage to the front men, and it's not just that he plays fewer notes so as to yield to the song. It's that in his reclusiveness, his demeanor on stage and in the press, his choices about what and when and where to play, he seems to yield his entire self toward a humble, service-oriented goal of making music with what you can, and no more. A note of this yielding of the self can be found in his few public statements. He once wrote on his website, I'm not interested in saving music, I'm here to serve music. And when asked what kind of music he enjoys, he replied, <laughs> so poetic. <laughs> While writing this essay, my agent urged me to contact Robin for an interview. But that's not what I want from him. Or what this essay is about. I did email his manager and ask, ask for his birth time, but I never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> Robin Fink showed me how to get to a world where language made of words can't go. I can only report back about how he first guided me toward that place. But I cannot explain what happens once you pass through the gate. And I doubt that Robin could either. When I considered which questions I'd ask if I were given the chance, I first thought I should ask about how he gets to that other place. Where do you go, I thought, would be a good one. But then I realized that no one who's been to that other place is going to be able to answer such a question. If there were an answer, it would be something like, nowhere. A better question might be, how do you stay in, in such that, like, what ways do you manage to inhabit this material plane with the rest of us? Although I imagine the answer to that might be, I don't know. After our interview, I sent Kelly Kalman a draft of this essay, and she highlighted this point and wrote back to me. There's not much to ask him, she said. Because that's like asking somebody to interview music. What would you say to music if you could? I can't think of a thing. I just have to let music be what it is. And that is what Robin is. She mentioned a video from his time in Guns N' Roses, not that one, a different one, when he plays solo to an ocean of Brazilian fans. By the time he opens his mouth to sing, she wrote, you don't even realize that he hadn't been singing. When I suggested to her that he might be from another dimension, she agreed instantly and told me that she once asked a friend of hers who was a spiritual medium to read him. The friend said, I don't mean that his body is extraterrestrial, although it is quite unusual, but his soul energy. 
She also pointed out that every Robin Fink fan she's met, there are few of us, but we're all like this, she said, <laughs> including me, has no sexual interest in him in a normative sense. She said this after I had explained my mysticism argument, and it reminded me that mysticism, despite its deep enmeshment with the body, is often thought of as asexual. I guess because it is a position of service rather than desire. But of course this entire talk is a proposal of troubling that. Wondering if service, if care, if kink is a kind of desire. I also found it notable that Kelly works as a nurse. In astrology, nurses are ruled by the house of care, which is also the house of devotion and service and includes nuns. Known as the house of ritual and work, some astrologers explain it as the house of magic, the ritual labor that one must do every day in order to make the most powerful magic that there is, staying alive. Sometimes I think there's no difference between mysticism and magic. Both have to do with what, both have to do with that paradoxical convergence of materiality and immateriality when one transforms into the other, and yet both somehow stay intact. That disintegration I felt as a teenager when Nine Inch Nails first rescued me, it transformed me totally. But my body didn't disappear. My materiality didn't cease to exist. It had just changed form. This is how magic works, and how mysticism works. It's also how music works. It takes you somewhere, not here, not on earth, maybe above it, maybe below. A place or a state where the rules and bounds of your materiality no longer hold. It defies gravity and time and reason and space. It gets you out of your head, yourself, and lets you feel, if only for a moment, somewhere, something else. But despite whatever transcendence it offers, it still happens here in your bedroom, your kitchen, your little life, within the bounds of your skin, and it changes those material conditions. It lives in your body, but then it also becomes your body. This is why it helps so much. It's got enough magic to bring you through the gate to that other dimension, but more than that, it's what makes being here bearable, because it is ultimately your companion in this world. Take me away for where I'm going and how I will get there, but also for where I live, for where I always am, here, right here. Give me something I can use to feel the scintillating spark of what it means to be changed. Thank you.